In a moment, we'll have uh, Justin Flatland come up and talk about agriculture opportunities in the current marketplace. Just a couple of things. We're talking about change in many ways uh, in our in our session today, in our side discussions. And, you know, change is hard for people when they're not leading it. A couple examples. I've been an advocate for shrinking our footprint in the city, mainly because people complain about their property taxes and their specials. Well, if you have more density, you'll have less of both. And I propose that we start by narrowing our streets by 10%. You would have thought that I asked people to get up and walk to work naked. And <laughs> people were pretty opposed to that. I would have been opposed to that too, by the way, just so you know. And then someone mentioned the legislature. I, was, I testified a couple times during the session. One was on the ability to move forward in our state uh, Uber. And if you're following modern day mobility and transportation, Uber is uh, one of those unique inventions that somebody created about five years ago in, in uh, probably their bedroom. And now they're gonna go for their initial IPO for about $41 billion. It's all it is is a kind of a taxi service. So anyway, I'm giving my testimony of support and that, that that's important in terms of moving forward and attracting and retaining talent and the young people expect this from old guys like us. And one of the senators asked me when I had expressed that my daughter who lives in Denver uses that service, is very familiar with it. I have the app on my phone as well. And the guy says, uh, Mr. Mayor, aren't you concerned about your daughter getting into the back seat of a car driven by someone she doesn't know? <laughs> and I said, uh, let me see. <laughs> Are you talking about present day taxi service? Or are you talking about Uber? I just don't quite see the difference. But anyway, they passed it. Now Fargo's going to have it. I had just a brief opportunity to meet with Justin, and I just learned that he started this business in his bedroom or dorm room or something, if I'm not mistaken. Justin Flatland is president of JM Grain with locations in Great Falls and Garrison, North Dakota. He buys and sells chickpeas. By the way, one of the things I look for at any salad bar, if it's, if it's not on the salad bar, I'm gonna order something else, probably a cheeseburger. Lentils, feed peas, green peas, yellow peas, and seed. Company name reflects the names of Justin and his father, Marvin, the company's garrison-based vice president. Please welcome this morning, Justin Flatland. Well, thanks, Mayor Mike, for the endorsement on pulses. We, uh, we, we do like them. So yes, uh, JM Grain, uh, we're located uh, in uh, Garrison, North Dakota, just, uh, just up the river uh, from you. And uh, I uh, uh, live in uh, near Great Falls, and, and my office is uh, right on the uh, shores of the Missouri. So uh, same common river here. We'll be sure to keep it clean upstream for you. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, transportation in our business is, uh, is a very key uh, a key component to uh, to the success of uh, of our uh, um, business, uh, uh, as the mayor said, we our main purpose of our business we are processors of peas, lentils, and chickpeas. And uh, peas, lentils, and chickpeas have uh, been growing uh, in the great state of North Dakota here for uh, many years, uh, probably on a large scale uh, since the uh, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. And uh, they were a uh, um, great timing to come in. At the time, uh, we were growing a lot of wheat, barley, durum, some chem fallow. Uh, if you notice driving around the countryside, you probably see uh, very little chem fallow uh, or, or summer fallow. Uh, now all of the, the land is planted into continuous crop farming. Uh, and the, the, the pulses really uh, were quite uh, revolutionary for agriculture. The mayor had mentioned about... Uh, you know the carbon footprint, or uh, and uh, pulses uh, uh, were brought into North Dakota and started growing 
and uh, they were uh, a great rotation to break up the disease cycle that was uh, happening by growing continuous crop durum and also to utilize some of the land that wasn't that was being left idle every third year so uh, pulses uh, came in uh, they there's they require no use of, of nitrogen uh, uh, commercial fertilizer added they are legume so therefore they uh, they produce their own nitrogen and uh, um, so again, that, that uh, fits the profile of, of a green crop and, and reduces the carbon footprint. So for the uh, environment, uh, pulses are, are, a, are a big plus here for our local environment. And in, uh, in talking about the river here that we have, uh, we can decrease the use of, uh, of nitrates that might uh, funnel their way in by the use of conservative methods of farming that keeps the uh, moisture in the fields and uses less commercial fertilizer. So for our business, uh, we are involved in purchasing from farmers. We currently uh, purchase, we have about a network of 700 different growers uh, in North Dakota, uh, Eastern Montana, and a bit into Northern South Dakota. And uh, um, part of this, uh, you know, this, this revolution that happened for, with pulses in the early 90s and 2000s, it, uh, it brought jobs to uh, before oil, uh, to communities like Garrison, North Dakota, uh, Crosby, North Dakota, uh, down in Bowman, North Dakota. My friend Les Paulson is here, who also has a pul uh, pulse processing plant. And uh, what we, uh, these jobs uh, that we, we were able to add value to the, agri to the uh, agricultural products in these small towns. So we had jobs, uh, instead of just shipping out bulk, um, bulk hopper cars, uh, we started shipping out box cars of bagged product uh, we started adding value by splitting peas uh, and lentils. We started doing some, uh, I know Les uh, supports a, a lot of the domestic uh, richly lentil production that, that, that so if you uh, go to the store and uh, buy a pack of lentils, a one pound pack, there's a good chance that that uh, could have come right out of Bowman, North Dakota, or possibly from our plant or one of the other plants. So not only was the, uh, the pulses a good, uh, a good fit for North Dakota in terms of, of the environment and how it fits into a system of farming. Uh, it was also good for the economy. And remember, this is a pre, pre oil boom at the time, uh, you know, uh, there was a big push at the time Governor Hoven was, uh, was really focused on creating centers of excellence and, and, uh, and, and the trade office and trying to attract younger people to stay in North Dakota rather than uh, leaving for uh, uh, bigger population groups. So, so pulses uh, came in uh, as, a, as a specialty crop, as a niche crop, uh, as an as a environmentally friendly crop, and a healthy crop. And, and uh, you know, yeah, we, we, the first year that we opened our plant, we, uh, uh, we employed 12 people uh, that, that in Garrison that uh, weren't uh, new jobs. They were, and they were all local people uh, that, uh, that we hired. And uh, it was, that's kind of how we got our start. So it was exciting, and that happened in many other small towns around uh, around North Dakota as well. So um, now, you know, the past 10 years that we've uh, been in the processing business, my father and I, uh, the biggest problem that we've had over the years uh, that has uh, caused us hardship and toil and, uh, and profit is transportation. Uh, we've got the product. It's a healthy product. It fits the profile of the consumer. Uh, Right now, buzzwords such as low glycemic index, non-GMO, gluten-free, uh, the, then the carbon footprint with the green, pulses fit that profile perfectly. They're high in protein, they're not, they don't have gluten, they're not, there's no GMO pulse crops. And again, as I mentioned before, they are uh, a great rotation to uh, reduce fertilizer and reduce energy required. So. We have all these uh, these good things, but but what we struggle with the most is is getting this product out of North Dakota. As you can imagine, uh, we uh, can't eat all the peas and lentils uh, that we grow here. Uh, so uh, that's been uh, over the years, uh, and and you can look at at our profit and loss, and you can see the years where we've struggled with the transportation, and uh, that transportation has uh, um, right you know for us. 70% uh, of our uh, of our put through through our plant in Garrison goes to export. 
So uh, we have to rely heavily on, on rail shipments in order to get that stuff from uh, Garrison over to Seattle or down to Houston or over to the East Coast. Uh, the markets currently are, uh, are, are heavily in uh, favoring export markets over domestic market. Now that, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, when we first started, we were about 98% exports and uh, just the small, basically byproducts as we sold to local cattle feeders. Now we're 70% we're, we're exports and we're providing, uh, instead of uh, providing uh, people in India with pulses, we're all, we're just with them, we're also providing uh, uh, hummus manufacturers in the East Coast. Uh, we're providing some, some green pea canners locally and we're providing some lentil packaging plants and snack food manufacturers. So there is a shift that, uh, that is happening but again, we still need to get either way, if we're shipping overseas or if we're shipping uh, domestically, we need to get our product to market the most efficiently way possible. And, uh, and that's where we struggle. Uh, as a single car shipper, that's what the railroad calls us, uh, meaning we don't ship unit trains or 110 cars at a, at a time. Um, obviously, for the railroad to send a, send a couple uh, engines in and pick up 110 cars and pull them to... Uh, uh, you know, an export facility in the Pacific Northwest, a flour mill in the Midwest, it's a lot more efficient than to have our four or five cars, three going to Houston, two going to Seattle. So we've, uh, the competition for rail uh, for our, our crops as a specialty crop has been very intense and uh, uh, unfortunately because it's not in the railroad's best interest to uh, to always provide us transportation, our business has at times suffered because of lack of uh, availability of boxcars, availability of hopper cars, and, and, a, and a reliable mode of transportation. Now, the other problem that this uh, creates for us is, you know, a lot of people within the, the industry that I'm in refer to themselves, you know, I, I buy, I sell as merchants or traders. I've never, as a farmer growing up, up by Garrison on my uncle's and grandparents' farm, I never got the, uh, uh, never likened myself to a trader um, with a D. I always thought of a trader that the traders that I deal with, I thought maybe were with the, the AT uh, traders. So with a T instead of a D uh, is what uh, the kind of bit of sharks. So I, you know, what I view our, our, our role in the industry is more of a supply chain management. So not only can we not ship, uh, just obviously to, to generate revenue, we have to ship. But when we do find good customers, like uh, we've been to many uh, trips with the North Dakota Trade Office over the years and have found very good markets. We, uh, this year I was in Italy with Larry White, and uh, then later on we were in Colombia. In both places we, uh, we were able to sell you know, product to good, good customers, uh, people that were uh, in Italy packaging uh, lentils that were going to the... Uh, the retail stores and down in Colombia, we saw both packagers and canners. But these folks that we sell to are relying on this product to come in. So I view, I really view my, instead of as a trader, uh, I, I, I consider myself part of the supply chain management. And uh, uh, supply chain management uh, is kind of a buzz term that's been talked about in business and, and logistics. And, and, and part of that is, is the freight. So for us, in order to supply our customers with the product they need, when they need it, uh, we need reliable transportation. And we haven't, so far in, in, in uh, Garrison, we haven't cracked that, uh, uh, that puzzle to, uh, to provide that consistently. At times we, we do okay, and other times uh, we don't. So um, sometimes we miss out on business just because simply we can't get the... Uh, the product to the destination on a consistent basis when they need it. Uh, the world seems to be going more towards uh, uh, more of a you know ready supply chain, you know hand to mouth. They're not wanting to put large inventories in place because um, with a large inventory is a position and that's risk and that's cost. So uh, so yes, we are definitely becoming <coughs> supply chain managers. Part of that that uh, process is what we do. So, uh, you know, a few years ago, the uh, Port of North Dakota was uh, 
had the, avail the availability to uh, ship containers. And uh, the containers uh, was a great thing for our company because 90% uh, of what we ship ends up in a container at some point. If we load a rail car, a hopper car in garrison and ship it to the port, if we load a box car and ship it to the port, it gets transloaded into 20 foot ocean containers. But unfortunately, again, uh, the, uh, you'll notice a common theme here, the, uh, uh, the container business uh, quickly dried up after uh, having service in Minot for about a year. And uh, the reasons that I've been given uh, for that is uh, the lack of cooperation with the rail. Again, competition uh, that we're seeing from industries uh, uh, in the oil business and in the grain business, coal business, everybody's uh, wanting to compete to have that transportation out of North Dakota. We grow so many natural resources and we have so few people that we export out of the state of North Dakota so much. There's a huge competition for that rail. So as far as statistics with what our company does, currently, you know, year to year, it, we can really take an average of 10 years and we can say about 50% of our products are going uh, to the south, to the, to the port of Houston, to the port of Lake Charles that would, that would fit into the, uh, the central North American trade corridor here and uh, there's a lot of products that we ship to Mexico, there's products that we would go to South America, even into uh, um, Western Europe, uh, in Africa, all is a, is a funnel that we could use to uh, access the, uh, the Gulf region uh, that would work moving north, to products moving north to south rather than uh, the uh, traditional method of going to uh, Seattle or Montreal. And uh, you know, we, uh, we look forward to uh, 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 different options as they present themselves to, to ship our products. We think uh, uh, we can take this, this healthy, wholesome product that we have in pulses uh, that, that the world is craving uh, and, and the U.S. is craving, if we can get that product out of North Dakota, get it to market, uh, get, it to, get it done timely, get it done efficiently, uh, we know that we can, uh, we, can, we can increase our business, which, uh, which increases uh, profitability for farmers and uh, increases uh, the, uh, what we can pay our employees. So uh, transportation is, is a huge deal, and that's, uh, that's why when Larry asked if I'd be interested in coming here, I'd say it's a, it's a very good thing because it's our most uh, challenging uh, issue that we have uh, as, we, uh, as we look at our business year in and year out. How much are we gonna be able to ship? Is it gonna be able to be on time? Are we gonna be able to meet our obligations with our customers? Are we gonna be able to meet our obligations with our producers? Uh, farmers also don't like, uh, as much as customers don't like to sit with empty shelves, farmers don't like to sit with full bins. So uh, um, both sides, we get uh, pressure to uh, ship and obviously we make our money on throughput, on, on processing, and shipping out and getting it. So we all win when there's, uh, there's transportation. So, um, you know, the, uh, the idea that Larry was talking to me about, about uh, a corridor along Highway 83, he said, well, would that, uh, would that affect our business positively? And, and uh, yes, it would, because we're already shipping 50% down uh, that's shipping out of the port of Houston, that's going to Texas, that's going to, to Mexico. And uh, so if we all of a sudden had 50% of our, uh, uh, of our, uh, of our put through uh, being more reliable, that would, uh, that would allow us to grow our plant and that would allow us to, uh, to expand. So that's kind of a summary of, of what we do and what we, what we see, what, we, what our struggles are. Um, some exciting news that we have uh, going on within the pulse industry. 2016 is, uh, has been announced by the United Nations as the year of the pulses. And uh, there's a lot of uh, momentum building uh, behind that. And uh, some national ad campaigns are, uh, are being in the works. Uh, we're trying to get this, uh, get, the, get the US public, well, we're trying to wait, raise worldwide awareness, but for, for us in the US industry and the Canadian industry, we're really focusing on the North American market. We have 360, 370 consumers here in Canada in the U.S. that, uh, that largely uh, are not consuming pulses. And uh, how many of you have heard of quinoa? So uh, quinoa, 
the year of, I believe the year of the quinoa, the United Nations designated 2013 as the year uh, of quinoa. And uh, it's been kind of uh, interesting to watch that that grain go from uh, basically totally unknown and consumed to where it is now, where here we are, uh, most people know it, and, and uh, my wife is always shopping for it and trying to get me to eat it, and I say, well, I, you know, we need to eat lentils instead. So uh, anyway, the idea with this uh, year of the pulses is, is that, uh, uh, that, that uh, both uh, the industry in the United States and Canada will, uh, will band together, uh, pool their resources, and, and try to create a national ad campaign that brings awareness to pulses uh, in North America. And some types of the ad campaigns that, that we're modeling this on uh, is, uh, you know, the beef, it's what's for dinner, if you remember that ad campaign, or Got Milk, um, that's another ad campaign that, uh, so that's kind of exciting for us within the, <coughs> within the industry. And uh, we think uh, we can more manage the uh, transportation if we're going domestically, <coughs> but still, to ship to the population centers within the U.S. along the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, the truck transportation we are at a disadvantage. We're, uh, you know, we're we're giving away uh, money out of the state of North Dakota to trucking companies uh, and uh, to get the product to market. So uh, um, there is this big push. It's pretty exciting that's that's going on. Uh, Shannon Burnt is here with the Northern Pulse Growers. They are also very active uh, in promoting the Year of the Pulses. And uh, I hope that, uh, that we're successful in getting this ad campaign off. And uh, next year, you'll be seeing, uh, uh, seeing some, some advertising uh, on mainstream media on what pulses are. And, uh, and that uh, will, uh, again, provide more, more needed transportation throughout North Dakota uh, for the pulse processors that are, uh, that are located in, uh, in Minot, in Dickinson, in uh, Williston, down in Bowman, North Dakota, Jamestown. Um, it will uh, it will greatly help us all. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'd uh, I'd take those now. Uh, that's uh, basically uh, what we've got uh, so far. How many people eat lentils? Well, it's almost as many as quinoa. That's good to see. <laughs> how many? Uh, let's. How many? Ten years ago, ate lentils. Uh, Okay, so yeah, see, so there's been, there's change coming. Uh, uh, that's uh, that, that, that's exciting. Uh, the fra the flavor profile of the lentil is uh, it, you know it can be molded to so many things. It's it, we really think that it can it can do what quinoa did. Yes, hey, just a question about the Canadian growers. Uh, do you have any connection at all with the Canadian pulse growers? Uh, uh, do you have any talks with them about? Uh uh, connecting up with them possibly, or maybe you'll discuss that. Just, uh, just I'll have another question after you answer that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. Canada has a has a very uh, big and active pulse industry. Canada's the the number one exporter of lentils and peas in the world. So yes, of course, we are we are partnering up with Pulse Canada, um, the, uh, the the national organization, uh, the U.S. Uh, dry pea and lentil. Uh, association has uh, partnered up with Pulse Canada. Uh, Shannon here from the Northern Pulse Growers probably knows more specifics about that, but there is a fundraising campaign uh, that we're, we're, uh, we're going to growers in both U.S. and Canada, and uh, Pulse Canada and the U.S. Tri and Lentil Council have hired the same, uh, Leo Burnett is the advertising agency in Chicago that, is, uh, that has been given the contract so far to come up with these. So, yeah, there's definitely some uh, collaboration going on between uh, Pulse Canada and uh, the U.S. industry in terms of pulses. And just the other quick question, I guess, is I uh, understand that there has been some, some uh, lentils and, and, and the different uh, pulse crops uh, shipped up through the port of Churchill. Uh, is that, has that, does that make sense for you from down here? Is it, uh, uh, doesn't it fit? Does it fit at all for you? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, going north, uh, the, what, what was shipped, from what I remember, what was shipped out of the, the port of Churchill for pulses that, that were from North Dakota and the U.S., I believe it was uh, yellow feed peas. Uh, there was back in uh, 2000, I forget the year, Larry probably remembers. Was it 2004 that Spain was the big buyer of feed peas? One of those, anyway, there was uh, a lot of peas. And, and Churchill does work, uh, you know, uh, 
my business is more, we're looking more uh, niche markets. So uh, we would be uh, very interested in container service that would call the Port of Churchill or con container service that would call Duluth, which I understand is possibly in the works too. But as far as bulk vessels, the normal thing that ships, I know there was some pulses that went that went out of there. And uh, and yes, the uh, going north, uh, um, shipping out of the lakes would be a, would be a big benefit. Uh, we would we would very much welcome container service out of that uh, that area. Um, that, that would be a key key component for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. In a moment, Dr. Barry Prentice from the University of Manitoba, professor of supply chain management, which Justin mentioned, will be here to, to talk about cargo airships. Before he comes up, it, you know, Policymakers, whether you're mayors or commissioners or legislators, governors or senators, you always hear uh, the importance of a sustainable communities. And when you break it down to the most common denominators, the community for it to be healthy and sustainable it has to have good health care. It has to have quality education, both of which lead to opportunities. You have to have adequate supplies of sources of water and, and then food. Everything else kind of falls into place unless you don't have ample ways to transport all those things that you need to be sustainable. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Prentice will share with us. He's a professor of supply chain management at the IH Asper School of Business, University of Manitoba. His major research and teaching interests include logistics, transportation economics, urban transport, and trade policy. Please welcome to Bismarck, Dr. Barry Prentice. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Uh, as you can see my talk, can transport airships improve the economic competitiveness of the Central North American Trade Corridor? Uh, this is uh, my second talk on airships in two days. When we got to the border, the guy said, uh, where are you going? And I think if we just said, oh, down to the target in North uh, Grand Forks, we'd have waved right through, but I, I was honest and said, I'm going to Bismarck to uh, speak at the Central North American Trade Corridor meetings. Well, he said, what's a corridor? First question. And I kind of raised an eyebrow. And then he said, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, airships. And all well, that really raised an eyebrow. So we had a nice long dissertation about airships at the border before I got here. So I, I'm kind of primed and ready to go today. Uh, what you can see on the screen is sort of a history map of, of airships. And a lot of people don't really know much about them except, well, there was a Hindenburg that blew up and that was about the end of it. But for about 50 years before the Hindenburg, there was a very active technology development in airships. And given the, the materials at the time and the technology, it's really amazing what was accomplished. If you look at some of these uh, uh, points, well, of course, we have the, the first airship here is the, is the uh, Montgolfier uh, balloon. But they actually had a, the first powered airship was Henry Gifford. It had an engine that was powerful enough and light enough to push the airship around a bit. But the first uh, uh, vehicle to cross the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean in both directions was an airship, the, uh, the R-34. The first vehicle to cross the North Pole was an airship, uh, the Norge. Uh, the first vehicle to do a circumnavigation uh, of the world by air was an airship, the Graf Zeppelin. Uh, the very first air passenger service was the Zeppelins. And of course, we had flights from Germany to Brazil uh, with the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg. And of course, this all came to a, a crashing end uh, when the accident occurred. And everybody thinks, well, that was the end of the airships, and that was why. And of course, that's not really the case, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but the airships did not go away. They were very active during the Second World War. 
uh, with the U.S. Uh, Navy fleet. And of course, they stayed around as advertising blimps, and more recently, we're starting to see them coming back. This is the Hindenburg. These are very, very big vehicles. Uh, 800 and th some, what, 803 feet long, 135 feet in diameter, so a 13-story building high. You can imagine that in essentially a two and a half football fields long. Uh, and it would carry about 70 tons of cargo. It was laid out as a passenger vehicle, but 70 tons of lift. And it would cruise at 80 miles an hour. It would cross the Atlantic Ocean in 24 to 36 hours. And it did that on a schedule. And by the way, it was not the maiden voyage. That was the Titanic that uh, went down. This one flew a whole season. It was the following year that actually had the accident uh, that caused its uh, demise. But that wasn't the end of the airships and wasn't the reason for the end of the airships. In fact, uh, we could ask that question, well, why isn't the sky filled with these vehicles? And the answer is airplanes. This is uh, obviously the, uh, the German jet airplane that appeared at the end of the war. During that five-year period, half a million airplanes were built. And in fact, today the civilian fleet's about 60,000 aircraft. So you can see how many were built and how many, of course, that developed very quickly in that technology because that was an ongoing thing. Well, after the war, uh, we had the Cold War. So more military investment went in billions of dollars invested in airplanes to go faster and higher and safer and better and so on. And of course, after the war, well, who needed airships that were not considered safe, that were slower, uh, and you could have a jet with trained pilots, we had airports everywhere, and of course, petroleum was cheap, um, nobody cared about that, um, and of course, uh, most of it was military paired airport air, uh, research. So what's the day situation today? Well, it's very different. Climate is a concern. Uh, there's a recent study out that noted that the airplanes of the world burn every day six million barrels of oil. That's a lot of oil being burned and a lot of pollution, a lot of carbon being put into the atmosphere every day. And they suggested, well, would you know, improvements in technology reduce that? And the answer was no, because the demand is so great that it'll compensate for any improvement in technology. So we're going to burn six million barrels of oil every year for a long time to come. And extension cords that long don't work, so no electric airplanes out there, I don't think. Of course, energy prices have risen and fallen, but I think they'll rise again. But what's really different is the demand for freight. Uh, the airships were only passenger vehicles, and most airplanes were only passenger vehicles, except for the belly space, where we put in uh, freight. Uh, the actual point at which we started getting dedicated airplanes for cargo was only in the 1980s. So FedEx and others came along. And now, of course, that's the fastest growing component of aviation is actually cargo. And of course, we see that with world trade expanding. So, a rhetorical question, what would the world look like today if the Second World War had been fought with airships instead of airplanes? Well, we'd certainly have a, a more advanced airship uh, in our presence, but it didn't happen. Uh, and this, by the way, is a, the U.S. Navy blimp. This would carry about 10 tons. Some of the endurance records set by these aircraft are still standing. And they flew in hurricanes, they flew in the North Atlantic. They're a very robust vehicle. Uh, not nearly the, the, they'll blow away in the wind, as, as many people might think. So this new airship, what's it going to look like? Well, it's, technology, of course, has moved a long way in 80 years. And we start to look at building large transport airships again. What would they be like? And what's this dominant design going to look like? And I'll show you some ideas that people have. But you can see there's, is it going to be rigid, like the old Zeppelins, or is it going to be an inflatable like the Goodyear blimp? Uh, how will we control the buoyancy? Will we put on ballast? Will we compress the gas? Will we vent gas? Will we use the engines? How are we going to move it up and down? And its shape, is it going to be a cigar shape or a catamaran or a disc or something in between? What about the controls? Will we actually have fins or just thrusters like we see on ships these days? The lifting gas, helium, or will we go back to hydrogen? Personally, I'm a big advocate for that, and we can talk later if anybody wants to know about it. Materials, metals, composites, nanotubes, turbines, diesel, electric, what's going to be the power? And then, will it be a UAV? 
certainly there's a good chance, I think, all aircraft could be UAV uh, uh, at a point in time. Uh, manufacturing, maintenance, and then finally economics down here in the corner. So this is one of the notions for lift. This is a, a catamaran style airship, uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, it's built one and flown it. Uh, the notion is it's heavier than air when it's on the ground, so you can land, take off the cargo, and you don't have to put anything back on because it's heavier than air already. And you use the engines and you, you go a bit of a run up uh, like an airplane. And it, essentially it's the aerodynamic lift that gives it the extra lift to move it through the air. It does burn more fuel, but you have the advantage of not having to worry about ballast. The other alternative is something like this, where you have compressed gas, and you simply release the gas from your holding tanks, the airship goes up, you press it back in, the airship comes down. Much like a submarine, operating the same way, and that is, by the way, the most comparable technology to an airship. So here are some. This is a US-built airship, uh, done for uh, a military contract in California. That's a, ri <clears throat> a rigid airship. It's supposed to have a rigid shell, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, a test vehicle. These little pads you see on the bottom are hovercraft-type pads uh, to lift it up and move it around. It doesn't need wheels the same way we'd have an airplane. Uh, this is a uh, uh, actually a, a French-inspired airship that's going to be built in Canada by U.S. folks. So there you have the, the world is really intertwined. Uh, you can see it's a kind of a rigid, also a similar shape to the, the one before. And uh, yeah, this is the only pictures we have of it, so not too much known yet. This is a Russian airship. Uh, actually, I love this design. I think it's one of the best. A, a hard, rigid shell, the loading door at the side. Uh, there's a lot to be said for this design. Unfortunately, uh, it is Russian, and therefore it's a little hard to get certified here in, in North America. Uh, this is a British airship. Uh, this one is not a, a picture, or sorry, a, a drawing. This is an actual photograph. This vehicle was built for the US Army uh, during the Afghan war as a UAV uh, to fly at uh, 20,000 feet and be a continuous surveillance on the ground below and so on. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, the Afghan war ended before they really got deployed, and therefore they didn't know what to do with it, so the U.S. military sold it for five cents on the dollar to the British, guys who built it, and they're putting it back into the air as uh, the air lander up here and they're supposed to fly next summer. You may think, well, that was a daft move by the US military, and I say, oh, smart like foxes. <laughs> These guys can pay for the development, they'll buy back the, the finished product when it's done. So we'll see. Uh, this is the Lockheed Martin version, and again, that's not a, a drawing, that's an actual uh, picture, I'm not getting this on here, of the, uh, in the lower corner of the vehicle flying. Again, hovercraft pads, and. This one's called the Sky Tug, uh, which they're building, and apparently it's supposed to be certified and flying in 2017. So these things aren't a long time away from us. Uh, this is a catamaran style again. Uh, I should go back for a second and note that these are uh, non-rigids, uh, like the one before. It's completely just inflatable, held by the pressure of the gas. Uh, this one is American design, but supposed to be built in Argentina. They said, no, no, we want to have a, a, a front that's more uh, hardened, and so it's like a semi-rigid in terms of its design, but very much along the same uh, idea. Uh, this is a Brazilian airship. There's about 40 engineers working on it right now. An interesting story, because it's a, uh, a cargo logistics company in Brazil, which it sounds like the presentation we just heard, they're sick and tired of not being able to get their goods where they want to go, when they want to go, because of congestion and roads washing out and so on. They said, we're going to build an airship to serve the Amazon. Here it is. So this is a semi-rigid, a keel on the bottom, an inflatable top. I don't know very much more about it than that, but it's underway. <clears throat> this is a British-designed airship, and it's an all-metal uh, airship. This is one with press gas. I put it up because this one on the side, oh, back here, this one on the, on the side is the 50-ton lift, and this is a 250-ton lift. To give you an idea of the scale, this is about 450 feet long and about 150 feet high. 
Uh, this one, I don't even know how big it is, but you can see the size. It's not uh, twice the size, but it has five times the lift. One of the advantages of airships is as they get bigger, they get much better. They're like ships of the ocean because they're displacement vehicles. So as you displace more air, you get much more lift. So really getting big is, is the issue. It's hard to find a market for a small airship. And you can't build a small rigid airship because you have to overcome the dead weight first before you get a useful lift. This is uh, our airship design. Uh, we've uh, got so far as a CAD drawing and specking it out. And if you look over on the podium here on the side, you'll see a, a model. Uh, that's a 3D printed model, by the way, just so you might find that interesting to look at as well. So it's an exact uh, replica of the, uh, the CAD drawings. Uh, this one is going to be, uh, it's designed to be 310 feet long. I can speak more precisely about its details. Uh, vectoring engines at each end. There's nobody holding ropes in any of these airships anymore. Now they land and they control their own uh, yaw and so on. Uh, it's designed for the north specifically and if you can't repair this with your gloves on, it's a problem. So it's being designed for uh, really northern transportation and of course it's a rigid shell because again keeping that that shell uh, solid with a, just a pressurized vehicle when our great temperature changes we see is a bit of a problem. Uh, you have to worry about the, the contraction and expansion of the gases. Uh, in any case, we can go on about this, but I won't. Uh, I'll carry on to talk about what are the implications of this technology for the Central North American Trade Corridor, because that's why we're here. And how would this fit into what you're doing? Uh, to note this first is that this is a chart which shows the carbon dioxide emissions from various modes of transport. Well, as we expect, aviation is the highest, then truck, then rail, then marine. It really, the, the fuel you burn is a function of speed. The faster you go, physics are such that you will burn more fuel. So you'll have more carbon dioxide emissions. And costs are somewhat similar to uh, fuel consumption as well. So the airship fits right in here, between the truck and the rail. Although, in terms of emissions, it's the only vehicle that's big enough that you can have a low-pressure tank of hydrogen as your fuel, so we literally could have a zero-carbon emissions vehicle in the future. And that's part of the hope that we extend out there, and we think we'll get there fairly quickly once it starts going. But the cost will be somewhere also in about here, not as cheap as truck, uh, but not as expensive as air. Mind you, as cheap as truck is a really... Uh, misleading term because we only think about the cost of the truck and the driver and the gas. We don't think about that big expressway out there. Who's paying for that? If you actually have to pay for the road and the truck, it turns out that the truck and the road are much more expensive than the airship because infrastructure is expensive to build and expensive to maintain. This is the reason we're looking at the airships mainly for northern Canada because we don't have roads. Uh, I like to tell people, 70% of our entire land mass has no roads or rail. We had a, one of our friends, a, a professor, they came up from Arkansas. It was a funny story because they just got across the border into Morris, Manitoba. And they got some gas and they were checking out and the, the lady said, oh, you know, we better get a map because, you know, we know where we are here in Manitoba. So she was at the till and so she got a map and she folded it out and she said, oh, I don't want this one. I want one that has all the roads. Because, of course, in the Manitoba map, you only find roads on that little part at the bottom. So, uh, you know, we don't have roads. And the cost of building roads in the north is very expensive, about $3 million Canadian, that is. That's, like, what, 50 cents U.S.? Um, per kilometer for a gravel road. So it's, it's really expensive and, and expensive to maintain. So there's a reason for this in the north, and it would open up a lot of our northern uh, areas for transportation. Well, big airships, uh, we think they will be a major force for moving goods across the oceans. Long distance transport, once we get to that 250 ton size, we won't just worry about northern Canada, then we'll take them to the, across the oceans. The Canada is very good because it's a place to start with small airships. You can go shorter distances with a smaller airship. I use the analogy of a pickup truck. Anybody can make money moving freight around Bismarck in a pickup truck but you're not going to carry your lentils to Seattle in a pickup truck and make any money. 
So you have to have a bigger ship if you're going to cross the ocean. And once we get big enough, they will cross oceans again, and they will carry freight. So what kind of freight? And how much freight? Well, this pyramid looks at the value of freight on the one side, and the cubic, uh, sorry, the weight value, and the cubic value, because a lot of vehicles bulk out before they weigh out. Agricultural products tend to be dense and heavy, and so they, they fit nicely in the box. But most things, the tennis shoes, ping pong balls, you name it, uh, they tend to be filling the vehicle before you hit the weight. And that's a problem with airplanes. It's a problem with containers. It's not so much a problem with airships because they're so big, the cargo bay can be very, very large. So looking at this, we have air. Sea air is a strange one. Uh, there's certain goods that can't afford to go all the way by air, but they're too perishable or they're needed too much to go by sea. So they'll leave Hong Kong in a container ship and go to Dubai and then be put onto an airplane and fly the rest of the way to Europe. So there already is a market in there that we could say would be for, uh, for the airship. And of course, there's a lot of goods that just simply can't afford that service that are going by container, and there's some going by air that don't have to go at 500 miles an hour. So what would be the market for the airship? Well, we think it's a pretty big market, and we think we'd eat up all the sea air, we'd eat into the air market, and we'll eat into the container market, and that's where it will fit. So then the question is coming back again. So why am I here? What does this have to do with the Central North American Trade Corridor? Is there anything at all? And here we are. This is the view from the top. Uh, it's a, a view that straight lines are the shortest distances. I always say that most of us get confused by the flat map Earth problem. We think the distances are related to the map we see in the world, and of course, it's not like that, because it's a sphere. It's not a flat plane, so the maps are all distorted. If you want to come from Japan or, or from Shanghai to Bismarck, a nice straight line right across takes you there. Or if you want to come from Germany to Bismarck, that would be appropriate. Then you have another straight line that comes straight across. Of course, you know, you might not follow that route exactly. Uh, the North Koreans are in there and they might want to take a shot at your airship, so I think you'd probably follow the water route. and You want to avoid the mountains uh, here too, so you'd probably come up through the but this is all pretty flat area around here, so it isn't adding that much extra distance to your, to your uh, trip. And then once you get here, well then, it would be transship to truck. We're not going to move anything in an airship that can move where there's roads. And it has to be delivered by a, a truck or a train ultimately anyway, so why not transfer it at the Regina Global Trade Hub or the Winnipeg uh, uh, Center Port or the Bismarck I don't know what you have here, but I'm sure there's a, a plan. And all those could be used too. It doesn't mean just one place is going to be a center. A lot of goods could come in and be transloaded here in the future. Well, that's the uh, certainly from the, the north. What about within intra North America or the Western Hemisphere? Well, one of the things we know about is these climate differences. We have many different zones of climate, so you grow different things in different places. And of course, one of the goods, or one of the things that we have is a lot of agricultural and livestock. This is an old uh, picture from Armour. I love it because it has all the cattle and hogs. This is, this is us up here, right there. In the, I guess we're in the oh, buffalo. Oh, I think those are cattle. Uh, anyway, uh, lots of things that are growing here that we can ship out. And of course, at the same time, you don't see a whole lot of bananas growing here. So we're bringing things in to this part of the world as well as we're taking things out. Vehicles like two-way trips because that lowers the cost. You have goods going both directions. So north and south, of course, we'll have lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. And we consume these year-round. I know this is no different here than where we live. And, if, and many of us would really like to have a tomato that didn't just look like a tomato, that actually tasted like a tomato. Well, if we had airships being able to fly uh, this distance uh, from where we are here to Cuba is about 24 hours in an airship, or to Mexico. And there's huge agricultural production in all this part of Mexico for tropical goods and, and many goods that we don't necessarily see here. And of course, we can also go, it's probably about a three-day trip to get down to Chile but then you have a whole bunch of other fruits and vegetables that come in. And we do bring them in, but only a limited number that aren't too perishable, as well as over to 
uh, Argentina and Brazil and Uruguay and so on. This point might also be a transshipment point for those trips coming in from Asia and from Europe that want to get to South America. So we have an opportunity here, I believe, in the center of the continent to be a real distribution hub if this technology is possible. And of course, it's back to costs. Uh, given that we can do it at a much lower cost than airplanes, our calculation would be at least uh, cut that cost in half, probably much better than that as they get bigger and the technology improves. And of course, five days from Asia, uh, maybe two and a half days from Europe, uh, it would be able to move freight in and out very effectively. I wouldn't recommend it for pulse crops. They might be a little too heavy but if the vehicle's empty anyway, then yes, in go the pulse crops. But certainly other things, meat products, dairy products, lots of things we do produce uh, could go out in maybe those bobcats too. So my conclusions, they're coming. This is really just a matter of time. And if you think about uh, this technology, 70 tons were carried 80 miles an hour across the ocean 75 years ago. The best we've done since is 10 tons of lift. I can't think of another technology where the high water mark was hit so long ago and we've come nowhere near it ever since. One of my friends pointed out to me the pyramids might be like that, but I discount the pyramids. I think that this is a case where it's a proven technology. We don't have to prove airships work. We know they work. It's a matter of investment and the technology to come together and do it. Now, might point out, there's no reason those airships couldn't be built here. Lots of aviation jobs. I do notice wind turbine blades uh, being produced in, in Grand Forks. Well, just little shorter ones, you put them on an airship and away you go, I suppose. But things could be built here as well as used. There's, there's two sides of this trade opportunity, not just the one. Mind you, goods will move up and down, so engines will come from someplace and so forth. New trade opportunities are awaiting. There's no question of that. And we're on the right side of history. This is a sustainable technology with zero carbon emissions potentially. And it's dealing with air cargo, which is the fastest growing demand. This is a technology which is coming. It's not a matter of, of when per se, but I say it's three years whenever somebody puts enough money on the table once that first airship out of Britain is flying next summer, well, that might be the encouragement for other people to try it as well. So this is something we, we should be thinking about. Uh, whoever adopts it first has the most to gain. Uh, so start thinking about where you want to put your big airship hangar. And with that, I will close. And thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll do my best to try and answer. <laughs> very interesting presentation. I, I would be interested to know what, um, in terms of capacity, what would your av the average weight of, a, of one of those big FedEx jets be compared to, or not the weight, but how much cargo? Yeah, the... Uh, land, compared a to a, a, a large airship. Yeah, a 747, I believe the, the latest version, will carry about 150 tons. And the Anatov will carry, or uh, yeah, Anatov will carry a bit more. But about 150 tons, I believe the A380, the new Airbus, and a cargo version will carry something more. And, uh, you know, a game for airships, that's why I say about 250 tons, because you have to compete with the big airplanes. And the airplanes are very productive. You know, the, by the time the airship makes it across the Pacific, the airplane could be back and forth two and a half times. So you have to look at what's the productivity of the freight as well as its cost. But the cost of airplanes are very, very high compared to airships. I would say that airships uh, or an airplane like the, the 747, I think they're running these days about 350 million at Kmart or at Walmart. Uh, but uh, the airship would probably be something closer to a, a third of that for that similar size uh, because they're less, there's less stuff. I mean, they're not pressurized. They're not going 500 miles an hour. They don't have big, expensive jet engines. They don't have to be built to that kind of standard. They are non-pressurized. Airships will fly about 5,000 feet, 
and go at about 80 miles an hour. So it's a, it's a simpler technology in that respect. I have a question. Um, the airship that you're working on, what, what kind of cost are you talking about to build something like that? <laughs> yeah, I know. that it, It's such a, it's a big problem or, or question for us, too. Uh, we believe that, in general, the airships you can build for about a uh, million dollars per ton of lift. Now, that's not a perfectly linear relationship. A smaller airship will cost more per ton of lift, and a bigger one, you start getting some gains in scale and size. So this airship you see over here, which would lift about 10 tons, we think we could produce those for something around uh, 15 million a copy. But the first one costs a lot more because you have to pay for all the research and engineering and the certification. Uh, we don't know the real answer for that. Some people say it could be $100 million. Some people say it'll be no less than any airplane. It could be a billion dollars. So there's the range, 100 to a billion. And, uh, but after that, once it is produced, they're much less expensive to produce as copies, at least according to the materials, um, and then it depends where you build them. Dr. Prentice, I think this was a fascinating uh, talk that you had here. So you stated that that airship will lift 10 tons. That seems awfully small to me <laughs> for that possibility. I'm just saying. Um, I, I think this technology, uh, this old technology, has great ramifications for the future for our region. Um, one of the things that I see with airships is, is moving things short distances as well. Uh, I really look at, you know, we have an issue in our area uh, because of the energy production with moving commodities like to elevators and that type of thing. Um, you know, could you maybe address maybe how a farmer that lives 20 miles from an elevator could maybe have containers that the airship just comes and picks up and takes to an elevator type of thing? It, you know, we should never say never about anything, but I am very reluctant to, to think that there's much... Uh, market for immediately for that sort of activity and the principal reason is the roads are already built the trucks are cheap very effective and ultimately you have to get onto a truck to deliver it to the pit so I don't think that the airships are going to be used for that now having said that we're already looking at the idea of what are essentially a UAV a very simple UAV lifting balloon with engines for logging purposes and for mining where they only have to go from a loading zone, maybe a road, 100 miles in, pick up 10 tons of logs, come back out and drop them off at the loading zone and then go back for some more. So that kind of activity with a simple airship is possible, but I don't really think it fits very much for the movement of agricultural products. Where it does fit, however, is for big, uh, what they call buff, big ugly freight. And those wind turbine blades are a good example of that. Uh, the reason that the wind turbine blades are 100 feet long is that's about as long as you can get through the road system. But the wind turbines would be much more efficient with 150 foot long blades, which is what they do use on the ocean. So if you could build the wind turbine blades, pick them up, and actually take them to the site of the wind turbines, then you could have much bigger wind turbines. You also may be able to use them to actually crane. So one of the other problems with the wind turbine is the crane to lift the turbine blades up costs so much to get there and, and to build that it really makes it expensive for installation or repair. Well, the airship might also be able to come in and load that thing in place as well as, as doing it. So there are uses like that, but I don't see very much for agriculture per se. I wish I could say there were more, but you know, I don't want to oversell this. It won't do everything any more than any other transportation will, but there is a, a very big niche that is unfilled today. If you look at the ocean, you've got really slow and cheap, which is ocean freight, or really expensive and really fast, which is airplanes, and there's nothing in between. Whereas on land transport, you've got everything. Airplanes are there, as well as truck and rail, and of course even barges, so you, know, you have many more options on land, but over oceans, you don't have many, and that's the, the big niche I think will be filled. Am I getting the hook? <laughs> that airship as a possibility of road maintenance and re the, the, the cost of redoing them all the time in these heavy traffic <laughs> areas and the oil field and things like that. I look at you, a niche that could be put into there 
a subsidized by the taxpayer type transportation movement to move this heavy material in an area around these oil fields and in heavy traffic areas and how much we would save on road maintenance and rebuilding our infrastructure. It could be a possibility, especially if it's a temporary deal where you know that it's going to be developed for say 20 years and then you're not going to use it. You know, then you have a stranded asset you spent a lot of money for on a road which will last 40 or 50 years. So there could be uses like that. It's, it's, again, I wouldn't rule out any ideas uh, per se, um, but it's going to be one of those down the road, I believe, if you'll excuse that expression. And with that, I'll, I'll get off the podium. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Prentice. See, you know, I, I'm a marketing guy at heart, and here's what I was thinking about. Uh, Mayor Ludwig, this is something you and I need to collaborate on, so if I might, we'll find a way to fund the manufacturing of all airships in, not maybe not globally, but clearly in North America, up in Esteban. And here's how we're going to pay for it. We'll have the International Airship Center, spelled correctly, R-E, in Bismarck. And we're going to call it the Led Zeppelin International Airship Center. In honor, of, if you didn't have this slide up here, Doctor, in honor of the 12 years, and you know, that's, German heritage, we appreciate the Zeppelin part of that. The 12 years from 68 to 80, where they stopped producing Zeppelins and just made music. And, and, and then we'll have the, the reunion tour launched from Bismarck, probably a year long, every other day kind of, of event. We can raise all this money and we'll share that and we'll start building. And what do you think, Mayor? Okay, that, that's how we're gonna do this. You gotta get that slide in there, the 12 years, doctor. I was never much of a comedian, just ask my wife. Next, new agriculture technology, Dr. Paul Gunderson, uh, Precision Ag of Devil's Lake. Dr. Gunderson is currently director of the Dakota Precision Agriculture Center located in Lake Region State College in Devil's Lake. He is the former director of the National Farm Medicine Center and former director of the Marshfields Clinic. I'm assuming that's in Marshfield, Wisconsin, of course. He is currently exploring the reach and impact of precision agricultural technologies upon U.S. and Canadian agriculture. Would you please welcome Dr. Paul Gunderson. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be here um, and explore with you some of the um, vicissitudes associated with the development technologically of new tools that are used in American agriculture. Let's begin with uh, just a brief look at uh, today's content and what I'll attempt to do in the short period of time that I have and then I'll transmit a couple of disclaimers right out of the starting gate. I feel a compulsion to define this whole concept called precision agriculture because it has enormous implications for those of us in the Central North Dakota American Trade Corridor. And uh, we need to uh, just briefly explore that in part also because it helps to limit or delimit what we consider in terms of uh, precision agricultural technology. Secondly, there are three legs that reside underneath this whole movement. I want to mention them just to give us a sense of what's underpinning this whole development and then we move on from there. Thirdly, why it matters to all of us, particularly in a meeting like this, and then finally end up with some examples about that, uh, that type of technology. So let's begin with the definition. You know, academically, as I work with our students, I attempt to underscore the fact that the precision agricultural movement began with a specific anchor. It didn't begin with the technology. It began with a concept, and here's the concept. Precision agriculture, as we use it today and as our producers use it, makes a very impactful statement 
by asserting that I'm going to use the tools and the technologies that are currently available to me, and I will use them because I want to maximize the genetic potential of the livestock and the crops that I'm privileged to raise. Nothing excites me more, I must add personally, than to ride in one of the nation's uh, airports, board that airplane, and uh, someone sits down in the seat next to me. And if they're in a chatty mood, and I am, and sometimes I'm not, but uh, if they are, then we often get very quickly to the question, what do I do? I don't typically say, well, I'm a college professor, or I work with students. I begin with the observation, my wife and I live on a farm. We love raising food, fiber, and fuel. That's generally enough of an introduction to consume the next three hours on that plane flight into Washington, D.C., or wherever I'm headed. It's an important conversation. And the reason it's important is because what I'm doing is always anchored, always anchored on the spatial and the temporal conditions of the climate in which I function, which for Paul and Harriet is 18 miles west of Harvey, North Dakota, north of the interstate, Interstate 94, about 90 miles. Everything I do is anchored on that. Now, going from there, in terms of that algorithm, this is the way many in the world, including those here in the U.S., look at today's agricultural producer. This happens to be the cab in which one of my neighbors functions. She's a real techie. And you can see that because the right side of the cab is what we're looking at here. There are four different monitors. There are a number of other gauges in there. There's uh, some enabled technology there in terms of telephone. There's a hard drive right in that cab so that none of the data is ever lost. There are a number of other technologies on the cab post on the left side. I didn't photograph those. While the public may think of precision ag as this, in reality, it's different. Here's a concept, and I want you to watch this carefully, not in terms necessarily the color of the branding, but in terms of the implications for us here today, okay? John Deere farm site. Field order. Please prioritize. Work order. Confirm. 
confirmed. Alert. Irrigation. Irrigation system initiated. Finishing up your planner service. It'll be ready today. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate it. You got it. Message from Crop Advisor. Changing seed population. Crop Tractor 14 has stopped. Message, Dealer Technician ETA, 32 minutes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is as about as close as we can get right now to the concept of the use of the technologies in order to raise what the world needs in terms of fuel and fiber and food. Now, underlying virtually all of that, as you probably noted, was an enormous amount of technology, including extensive use of sonographic devices for purposes of controlling what's underway in that farmstead, what's underway in that tractor cab, alternatively combine cab, alternatively crop protection product applicator, that kind of thing as well. Let's look at the impact of Precision Ag at this point. Last year, 2014, the U.S. agricultural industry alone used over 400,000 of the types of devices that you saw depicted in that video this morning. High accuracy microprocessors. Every harvester, every combine harvester that rolls off of an assembly line here in the U.S. or Canada will contain as a minimum at least 28 of those per harvester unit. Heavily dependent on the IT, the information technology interface highway, as well as the embedded electronic technology that goes with it. The impact fiscally, 13,000 each, 19.9 billion per annum. 
Huge, huge investment. By the way, just as a comment, Wired Magazine in February came out with a disclosure that is causing uh, a bit of angst amongst agricultural producers. As the firm that produced this video stood before the U.S. Patent Trade Office in an effort to protect its investment, it made a statement that uh, has caught the attention of agricultural producers. It stated, producers who buy green equipment don't actually own the equipment, they're leasing it. And the reason for that is because the rear end of the equipment all the way forward to the front end is laced with technology, focused on ensuring that that technology is perfected and works perfectly at the same time that data is transmitted back and forth across numerous, numerous microprocessors and then out into the greater world where you and I function as agricultural producers. Up here, and by the way, the use in Canada is probably even higher than this based on what we have seen about 80 miles to the north of us. Up here, approximately 92% of the agricultural producers in our state are using one or more of these technologies. Now, a part of that has to do, and welcome, Governor, thank you for joining us this morning. I was just going to mention that one of the differences in adoption rates, one of the clear differences between states is that a state like North Dakota has made a huge public investment in the fiber optic sonnet that circles the entire state and feeds webs all the way in. It's a web system. That means that on Paul and Harriet's farm, we could get onto that ring five years ago. That's in part why we have adoption rates like this because the technology is readily available for agricultural producers to tab into so that they can employ this technology as they attempt to derive the greatest genomic potential out of the crops and the livestock that they're raising in this state. Now contrast this with Oklahoma. When Ad Farm, Flint Communications in Fargo, and the D Dakota Precision Ag Center last did our survey work in 2010-2011, 38% of agricultural producers in Oklahoma were using one or more of these technologies. Why? The difference. A huge hunk of that difference has to do with the fact Oklahoma has no fiber optic sonnet. That makes an enormous difference in the rate of adoption those of you, our friends to the north, have made similar significant investments provincially to ensure that your agricultural producers are positioned and capable of capitalizing on this technology all the way forward. There are some reasons why the adoption rates have emerged as they have, particularly here uh, across the trade corridor. And some of that has to do with the fact that American agriculture and its potently evident out here on the Midwest Northern High Plains arenas. Potently evident, capital intensive, intensive use of the technology as it is unfolded. In fact, as I go to other states in the nation, sometimes I'm introduced as the person who comes from a state, which is a hotbed for technological innovation in the precision ag technologies. That may come as a surprise to some of us, but the largest archive of satellite imagery presently retrievable resides with a firm that has capital offices in Fargo and Maddock. The largest vendor, independent vendor of software is just across the Red River at Halsted, Minnesota, a community with fewer than 400 people living in it largest present software vendor. The largest Case IH dealership vending Case IH precision ag products is located at Devil's Lake and Harvey, North Dakota. Largest one in the nation. Selling more than any other Case dealership in the nation. Folks, this is a hotbed in terms of our ability 
to birth technological products that respond to the need for producing food, fiber, and fuel in the most efficient way possible. Moving on to the commitment to information technologies, I've mentioned some of that. There's even more that's underway. We presently have firms located not only in the Red River Valley, but out beyond the Red River Valley that are exploring a plethora of technologies, all the way from very, very sophisticated proposed guidance systems for unmanned aerial vehiclers, all the way across to now the first receiving station in the nation Erected by Planet Labs Incorporated. How many of you have heard of Planet Labs here in the room? Anyone? Private sector firm, North Co coastal based, Northern California based. They will have placed into orbit by this time next year 104 satellites, low orbit satellites. That means that for the first time in the world's history, I, as an agricultural producer, can download daily satellite imagery of the fields where my crops are being grown. Daily down feeds. Not two weeks, not ten days, daily. And those images will be available within approximately 32 minutes of the image having been taken by that low altitude satellite. Where is the satellite receiving station? Just south of Maddox, North Dakota just erected this winter, now in test mode. Folks, the North American Trade Corridor is where the action is at this point in terms of this kind of technology as we go forward. I'm going to move on. This is an important observation in terms of use of this algorithm and it possesses impact for those of us in the Trade Corridor and that is that agricultural labor as we think about it is a vastly changed domain today. It's no longer, even though I just looked yesterday at some of the press coverage, and it almost grieves me. Because some of that coverage, first of all, the tractor that was depicted in the photo hasn't been manufactured since 1938. It's a Pharma F20. It doesn't have a rollover protective structure on it, so that should it tip or flip over backwards, the operator will be killed. A youngster was riding in the seat with the operator. You know, we don't do dumb things like that anymore up here, for the most part. We know better. The technology is enormously different from that. And so is the labor. Last summers I worked with Cargill. They pulled together 200 of their largest producers and without saying anything to the press, they all met in Benson, Minnesota, southwestern Minnesota. They asked me to come forward and give, them, give those 200 producers a brief overview of where the precision ag technologies, particularly the airborne ones, might reside and be useful in their operations. One of the things that happened is that one of the chief buyers from one of the big box stores in North America was at that meeting. And he spoke to those 200 producers, because Cargill is one of their frontline suppliers, spoke to those 200 producers about their vision worldwide. And he said, oh, by the way, we're going to be requiring full farm to store shelf certification about the products that are going to be retailed in our store. And he said, we're going to require that every producer certifies to the fact that no slave labor has been employed on that agricultural operation. We're further going to certify that no children under the age of 16 have been engaged in producing those agricultural products. Think about that. The labor domain here has changed dramatically across time. 
And for those of you in the pulse world, that's a huge impact. And the certification process, in theory, is supposed to begin next year. That changes the nature of the relationship between me as the producer and the customer out in the end, wherever that end may be. So the labor quotient changes dramatically. Operator, as you can see there, also changes very significantly. Now, autonomous. Why is that so important to us as agricultural producers? And that's, this is the implication, at least in part, for what we're doing today, what we did yesterday, and what you'll be exploring tomorrow. First of all, when we go as producers to autonomous operation, we change the dynamics of weight, scale, and powering. For example, one of the significant issues this year, by the way, the UN has declared 2015 as the year of the soil. One of the huge changes there, when we go to autonomous operation, is that we change what we do in the field. Since compaction is such a huge issue out here in the high plains, in part due the, to the calcareous nature of our soils, you know, the fact that they're all glacially deposited. Thank you, Canadians, you gave us some marvelous soils that all came from up there. And it's been deposited down here as the glaciers melted 14,000 years ago. Marvelous soils, variegated, interesting soils, challenging. But that means that the weight restrictions on agricultural equipment play large. If I go to an autonomous tractor, the first thing that happens is that that cab is removed. Now I'm saving eighty dollars to $140,000 off the price tag of that unit to begin with. Secondly, I can now downscale because if I operate autonomously, I should have brought it up here. I didn't, Kathleen, I'm sorry. But at any rate, I can work off a tablet. Beginning last fall, the first autonomous operations here in North Dakota were tested by a firm that produces autonomous equipment in Iowa. And Orion, you know which one I'm speaking of down there. The grain carts were governed and controlled from the combine cab. No driver in that tractor in front of that grain car. Well, unless they wanted to be there just to watch. But it wasn't imperative. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world we're headed into. A world in which the operator will now operate perhaps five units in that field. So instead of five to 700 horsepower and all of that weight in one tractor, now we have five tractors in that field with smaller implements. And all of a sudden, all of these problems associated with soil compaction have vanished just like that. Because now our footprint on that soil is dramatically lower than it was with the other technology. Secondly, we can increase machine hour work use. One of the comments I often make to my students is, you know, students, I've never had a producer come to me and tell me, Paul, I just don't have enough to do. I've never heard that from any of them, and I've talked to thousands of them across my career. What does that mean? The implication here is, if I operate autonomously, with careful planning, I can keep that, that machine or those machines operable 24 hours a day and pull them down only for fuel and checking of components. People can't work like that for very long. So in a cycle like we're headed into next week, when after the sun has shone for about, oh, three days or so, and our producers are really anxious to get going now, it's time to get the soybeans in the ground, the tail end of the corn. Some of the pulses need to be inserted into the soil, and then we move on to sunflowers and all of that. We've got growers that are becoming anxious. They've been waiting now for, what, nine days? Wonderful rains. We needed them. But now time is constricted. I can go with autonomous technology. When I go autonomously, I change the labor quotient as well, because now one operator can handle several different technologies all at once. Finally, for 
agricultural producers, this whole business of liability insurance, health care insurance, and all of that kind of thing, the, the dynamics of the insurance quotient change when I work with autonomous technology. And then, of course, there's this whole business. You know, if you sit in an, a restaurant in a rural area, we have four of them in the community of Harvey, and each one of those restaurants possesses something that I call the table of knowledge. That's where the producers, the owners of these enterprises gather early in the morning. And what are they doing? They're having a cup of coffee and they're all sharing fabulous tales with one another. And that's also where the conversation unfolds about who has the straightest rows and who appeared to have a hangover as they were in that field. Well now, with this kind of technology, the hangovers are totally camouflaged because, my goodness, everything is just straight as can be, and the reason why is because we've robotized what we're doing. That may sound kind of nasty, but that's what we're doing. And we're precisely control virtually all of the machine operations. So, when I work, as I do purposefully, raising food, fiber, and fuel, and I want to maximize the genetic potential of what I'm doing, I will do so using the technologies and all of the investments uh, that you see here. There's the drone that we often use when we work in agricultural environments because it's been ruggedized. It's a simple instrument. Down over in this corner, uh, on yours truly, uh, he looks kind of tired, I'll admit, and it was kind of a difficult day that day, but um, wearing Google Glass. We tested for the first time the use of Google Glass last summer. The computerized capability right up here on the left side. The computer is in the side arms of the glass piece. And we tested that for the first time, perhaps uh, ever here in the US, where we took images of bugs and diseased leaves and I forward them to Montana State University, North Dakota State University, and about an hour later I had a response on my telephone from a scientist who could tell me precisely what that crop needed at that point in time. And you see, that's maximization of the genetic potential. When I hit that bug threshold, I need to get a crop protection product applicator in that field. The same holds true on the bug side. Google Glass works very good for that. And by the way, there aren't too many of us who are feminine in here. But you know, one of the comments I made this winter, and it hit a concord, uh, as I did some outreach work, outreach work this winter in the western third of the state, I commented that, you know, for those of us who are single and we're searching for a mate, this technology works real well. Once I've been introduced, I can tap on the side of the eyepiece and I can tap in the name of the individual to whom I've in, been introduced. And you know, women, if you're going to hook up with a guy out, on the, out to the west here, why not at least scan to see whether there are any oil field assets? You can do that using this technology because the next thing that I did was check in two or three of those counties, they have automated virtually the entire land ownership file with the mineralites attached. So now, tapping my side, I can figure out if there's a match. Not such a bad outcome, you know. Maybe you'll discover the guy's a real bore other than that, but, you know, those discoveries flow after you've first screened for the asset level, okay? Not too bad in terms of technology going forward. The UAB, we've talked about that already. With unmanned aerial systems, just a few comments here as we head towards uh, the lunch hour today. With the agricultural environment, there's enormous potential in part because we're working off of or above relatively lightly populated terrain. And as I go over my crops as I have, using the technology, there's not a single spear, not a single leaf who protests. And I'm always very careful. Again, I recognize that the tables of knowledge in these local restaurants also are places where disclosures are made. And sometimes I may comment to a neighbor of mine, well, I just drove by your fields this morning. Why was there something interesting there? 
With UAV technology, that's a no-no. You don't spy on your neighbor's crops. Fundamentally unethical, also currently illegal, by the way, uh, but that's another story in terms of the regulations proposed by the Federal Aviation Administration. But there are some things I can do with this technology. I use this slide partly because many in the agricultural animal world believe erroneously that the precision ag technologies have bypassed their enterprises. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It's just that we haven't quite gotten there yet. But here are some examples. I can take either one of the units that are on the table over in the area where we're displaying, and I can program them using GPS coordinates so that they will fly right over the feed bunk here. And what am I doing? I'm monitoring feed bunk cattle usage. The reason I will do that is because I don't like stale feed in the feed bunks. The cattle won't feed, won't feed on that. And you know, as a producer, I'm on an algorithm here where I've got to gain something approaching 3.1 pounds a day or more in order to cash flow my operation as a feedlot. Secondly, I really don't want skunk and coon and rats and coyotes feeding out of my bunks. One of the things that the wild animal kingdom world brings is this inherent notion to scent everything. So what happens when these creatures come into a feed bunk? Well, they urinate all over the feed. That's not such a good outcome, because now I gotta deploy manual labor to clean out the feed bunks, or I gotta use a feed bunk blower, which blows it all out of the bunks, cleans them out, so that I can run with my feed. You see, in the animal kingdom, I precisely control, in animal agriculture, what I do, in fact, as I point out to my students, aside from the First Nations peoples of here in North America who first used the precision ag algorithm before the pilgrims came, remember the story? They correctly placed two or three fish, marvelous source of nitrogen and some of the minor elements under that hill. The corn seed was planted on top. And then they interceded with other food crops. The American Indians of today have told me, Paul, we're appalled when we read about the struggles your ancestors had when they came to this nation because we had their problems solved for them. We knew where to place precisely the nutrients. And we also knew that with intercropping, you didn't have the weed pressure that the colonists had. There were good reasons, well not good reasons, but there were viable reasons for why the colonists had such a terrible time feeding themselves. I would state they didn't know how to use the precision agricultural algorithm correctly. Moving on, livestock, another operation where this can be used. Thank you. Let me just demonstrate one use. If you want to bring that up, please. This is rotocopter UAV technology. assessing legume cover. I'm also evalu evaluating the cattle as a flyover. And if these were herd of mamas, I'd also be evaluating where the calves are, their body condition, the general shape of those cattle. And finally, I'd be evaluating predator pressure. Oh, 
by the way, at this point I'm flying over the allowable limits that the FAA has currently stipulated. But I can do this because this is Australia. Okay? But it demonstrates the use of the technology in livestock operations, just one example of several that might unfold across time. All right. There are some other ways in which autonomous technology contribute to the agricultural paradigm that I've explored with you this morning. One of those significant ways is we now have the opportunity for the first time arguably in human history to remove humans from hazardous work sites. We in North Dakota house two of the most hazardous work sites known to the developed world. Mining, agriculture. Most years, those two industries will lead virtually all others, not only in terms of untimely death due to injury, but also in terms of the disease burden associated with the human exposures in these agricultural work sites. What do I do when I use these kinds of technologies? I now begin to move towards that plateau where I can take humans out of the most hazardous of those environments and replace those humans with these emerging technologies. And so I provided you with some examples here. I don't have to ha uh, clothe humans with personal protective equipment. I don't have them exposed to some of the outdoor elements. One of the reasons why this technology appears so attractive to those producers and agronomists who do a lot of crop scouting in the summer is because I can fly the UAV off the bed of a pickup and I never have to walk the fields, or very rarely do I have to walk the fields. Now that is inherently attractive because finally, I now have a technology which at 6 a.m. in the morning means I'm not swatting mosquitoes ferociously as I walk the fields. I'm not wet to the ankles or to the knees as I walk those fields. I'm not having to deal with bees. We're what? Number two in the nation, I believe, in terms of production of honey in this state. Number one, thank you. That means that occasionally bees are out there. They're doing their work. They're, they're pollinating. But they also occasionally like to feast on me. I'm in their way. I can get rid of that in a quick hurry. By the way, for those of us who are concerned, terribly concerned about the current proposed regulations governing unmanned aerial vehicle use in agricultural premises, this is what happens when we're not careful. This pilot flew right into an unmanned aerial vehicle, same size as what we have on our tables over there. That's catastrophic. That's why the FAA has made it very clear. Number one priority with respect to the use of this technology in agriculture, and they expect it to be used heavily in agriculture, number one priority is maintaining the safety of the nation's airspace. That's preeminent. It trumps everything, including potential commercial uses of the technology and its applications in agriculture. Here's why. You see, there are manned aircraft functioning in the same airspace. And that's why the FAA, amongst other things, has mandated that all unmanned aerial vehicles will be outfitted with technology that automatically transmits the message, I'm now airborne, here's where I'm at. Any other pilot, flying pilot, private aircraft, or commercial aircraft will be able to recognize that signal and can divert. Similarly, the FAA requires lighting and marking. Strobes will be going on the technology, so should the radio beacon not be heard, there's something that a pilot can see which announces that there's another object in the air. That, by the way, takes unmanned aerial vehicles in terms of purchase price largely out of the hobbyist world because now we're talking about several thousand dollars of additional cost and technology that has to go on every one of those vehicles. 
But you see, in terms of production agriculture, that's going to be okay because we too care about the nation's airspace. Amongst other things, and as I work with producers, I'm very careful to point this out. One of the reasons the FAA has indicated, well, there are two reasons why it's important to go through a certification process in order to operate this technology. There are two reasons. Number one, in order to use this technology, we have to know how to operate in the nation's airspace. We've got to know about aircraft radio messaging. We've got to know about the use of VHF. Similarly, we have to know how to access the nearest controlled airspace port because we're operating in the nation's airspace. But the second reason is because if all operators in commercial environments, and by the way, all agricultural operations with a very few exceptions are commercial, they are commercial, the FAA has stated, so there's no more argument about that. One of the other reasons for that is because if we go to a certification process, at least there's one way of ferreting out the bad guys. And as I've pointed out repeatedly in the past, protection of the nation's food supply is paramount. This technology presents some challenges. It doesn't take a lot of technology, as I pointed out to two of us here this morning. I can work off my wife's kitchen counter. And because I'm trained as a biological scientist, I can weaponize anthrax on my wife's kitchen counter. Once it's weaponized, I can carry a very small quantity of it, about a gram, and using this technology, I can place it right in the middle of a feedlot. That gram is capable in 72 hours of infecting over 6,000 critters. 6,000. And then those infected critters move out because now they have to be killed, they have to be buried, now the skid steers, the front end loaders, everything in that feedlot is contaminated. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a serious issue in terms of protection of the nation's food supply alone. Very good reasons for certification processing relative to this technology. Um, mention was made of the use of remote sensing technologies with respect to thermal imaging. There are some interesting things that can be done there. Uh, that's a cat post over on the left side. Some other imaging on the right side, all of it off of this kind of technology, human exposure. Uh, let me move ahead. This, by the way, this is the satellite that's currently being launched by Planet Labs. 104 of them a year from now, flying in low orbit. They will remain in low orbit five to six years, then they'll burn up as they re-enter the atmosphere. New ones will be hurled. This is all a private enterprise, all premised on the notion that imaging of the world's surface, in our case, North America, is crucial to our functioning agriculturally and, and from a natural resource perspective going forward. Okay, I'm just going to end, uh, let's scoop over this, um, okay. As we head toward the end, and I now return to that first video with all of the sonography technology in it. Notice that all of the products come in had, had largely to be brought in. We can do that by autonomous trucking. We can do the same thing in terms of movement of the product out. We've heard some conversation about that this morning. As I drove last week from uh, Devil's Lake down to uh, Jamestown, I was reminded again of uh, an almost nascent rail line that theoretically could be rehabbed, refurbished in the absence of airships or other forms of autonomous movement such as we heard of yesterday afternoon, evening. And our product could go north. 
You know, 96% of the product raised on Paul and Harriet's farm presently goes to the Pacific Northwest, given the cropping mix we have. I would love to have another alternative, particularly last year. Going to Churchill, the port of Churchill, and out of the Hudson Bay where we can ship, what, nine and a half, ten months of the year currently with the warming trends? That'd be a marvelous, marvelous competitive advantage for those of us who have to move product elsewhere in order to reach our market. Finally, I can go a couple of other directions. We haven't done much with this today, but autonomous technology relative to fabrication using 3D printers and on-man delivery of parts. There's a whole world in front of us, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been my pleasure to talk with you just briefly this morning about some of these technologies and their implication for those of us in the North American corridor. We're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gunderson. Uh